This week on the podcast, we welcome back author of my favorite book, Mediated, Thomas DeZengotita. We have a great conversation as usual, and I love him. The kind of reflexivity that we all developed about our, you know, ourselves, and in the process of kind of kind of figuring out who you are, so that you can perform your who you really are better. I mean, what a paradox, right? Yeah. I want to know who I really am so I can give a better performance of what I really am. I don't think people think of it that way, though. No, but you know, that's I... what they're doing. Right. You, to, to just talk to anybody who's seriously been through therapy about why they're better and how they're better. And, you know, you just tweak the lines a little bit and you'll find that they're saying, I found out who I really am now and I'm not afraid to be myself well, that, that means that you are now, you know, feeling freer to perform who what you really are. You can't, it can't not be a performance if you're that self-conscious about it. This is Walkins. Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. Walk-ins Welcome is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Call 888-614-9238 for a free investor guide today. All right. I'm back with my friend Thomas. How are you doing? I'm hanging in. Yeah? Yeah. We're going to talk about the autumn, my favorite season. October, Me too. The best month. It really is the best month. Yeah, the best month. Um, it is the, it is the, my favorite. I really miss New England falls. There you go. And now we're in Texas. So we get a very strange version of fall. Ooh. Ooh. I remember fall in San Francisco. All I remember was the fog got worse, but I, yes. don't, remember, you know, I don't remember much else. Yeah. I just, it's so cozy. It's such a cozy time. Yes. And then it get and then it gets grueling. <laughs> yeah, right. And then those New England winters. Yeah, they are. They're they they make tough men. Yeah. Um, I wanted to continue our conversation about your book, My Bible Mediated, and boy, oh boy, does it does it become more prescient every time we talk? It's it's oh. actually. I feel like, too, it's always the chapter that I need to read exactly when we're about to talk. This chapter is chapter five in your book, and it's busy, busy, and it's all about the busyness of life. Although in the in the first paragraph, there's something interesting. Again, I just it's so funny to read this now and see how how um, how much this has actually played out in almost 20 years since you wrote this which is actually also crazy to think. Um, if you deal with only digital interloc interlocutors, it may take more time, but you can do it in your underwear, figuratively speaking as well. <laughs> and more and more people like doing things that way. And I was thinking about the kind of rise of, as my friend terms it, the pajama jobs during yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. And we were just talking about this on... Um, one of my my other program, Dumpster Fire, that's a little more satirical and comedy based about how everyone just wears their pajamas everywhere yeah. now. Yes, uh, uh, all over the sidewalks. Very true. Everywhere. I, I live Airports. near Bard. I live near Bard College, and you know every other student's in her pajama in their pajama bottoms at least. Yeah, and you say that um, you know people, middle class people, used to dress up for social encounters of all kinds they'll show these crazy videos of new york in the 40s and 50s and if people would be the doctors if you went especially if you took an airplane oh yeah that was like a big deal you got really dressed up 
You know, I've been thinking a lot about something too, uh, and I've been flying here and there, very quick trips, but something, this new phenomenon that I noticed, and it it's, I, I actually now think I can attribute it to screens or maybe some sense of being polite, but everybody leaves their windows closed upon takeoff and landing unless mm-hmm. they kind of are asked to open them for safety reasons or mm-hmm. whatever, which sometimes they are. And that's fascinating to me because it shows too, just again, in line with people used to dress up when they flew, but I think flying was still kind of a novelty a little oh, bit. Oh, it was an adventure. Yeah, absolutely. And now it's something we take for such granted. No, I, I still want to see when we take off and well, land right. and, uh, and yeah. people just well, close their... Yeah. No, yeah. Get, that, get that screen going that's on the back of the chair in front of you. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of... Yeah, you can that, watch whatever you want. Yeah. You don't have to let nature decide what you're going to see. <laughs> There's a great <laughs> Louis C.K. Have you ever seen Louis C.K.'s bit that he does about flying and how yes. our our modern society gets mad at things that we didn't have right. five minutes before? Coming from outer space. <laughs> yeah. And can right. you give it a minute? And you, yeah. you're you're angry about you're Wi-Fi angry and you didn't have it five minutes ago. Yeah, that's a great bit. That's yeah. a great bit. Yeah. yeah. So what, what have you noticed since you've written the book and just – talking about this, what was the kind of point of talking about how people used to dress versus now and the well, busyness? Well, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, there's lots of different subsidiary points depending on the area of our lives you're talking about. But by and large, I think what's happened is that, that people are, uh, that the process of self-presentation, the process of self-performance has gotten more and more inward. Uh, You're more and more acting, I call it method acting in another part of the, you know, you're really living a kind of performance now, whereas back in the days when you got dressed up to go on an airplane, you could say it was a performance in the same way that, you know, if you get dressed up for a wedding or, you know, you, 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 you present yourself. Mm-hmm. Huh. And the ironic dynamic involved here is that back in the day, people were very self-consciously presenting themselves publicly in appropriate attire. And, you know, this is, I'm obviously talking about a certain class of, people um, with appropriate manners and so on. And uh, we're much less, and I know this, I just, I know this literally from, it's not scientific, but statistically valid, but I, I have this conversation with, uh, have had over the years, this conversation with people older than me. There are not that many of them left, but people my age and older than me, uh, uh, trying to get them to kind of talk about uh, who they think they really are mm-hmm. inside. Yeah. And a huge number of them said, what? You know, well, you know, I'm a doctor. I'm a father. What are you talking about? Whereas if you ask a modern performer, most of whose performances are according to the method and involve their f- deepest feelings and relationships, about which we today in the last 20 years, you know, are, are so self-conscious. It's like mm-hmm. we've all been in therapy, even if we haven't. Mm-hmm. And the, the amount of self-consciousness that we bring to the world uh, leads us to be presenting ourselves or performing ourselves much more deeply. We're, we're performing our inner selves. You might say we're performing for ourselves. Whereas before we used to you know, go home and you know, then you dress up and you go get on the plane and you perform the formal, whatever it is, much more than now. Is that better or worse? You know, is it, is, is it, is it less status? Well, I can tell you this as an old, 60s person back in the day i bourgeois manners 
you know, the way I was brought up, I, 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 it's not too strong to say that I was enraged by what looked to me like the utter phoniness of my parents and their friends. Right. Because of my father's job, he, they, they had to entertain a lot. There were a lot of mm. people. There. And the watching my mother and father perform their roles. And, of course, it, they dress up. Cocktail party. The little bowls of peanuts. And <laughs> we'd be up in the upstairs waiting for everybody to leave so we could dash down, grab the peanuts out of the little, you know. But uh, so I, I and I'd watch them and I, or I'd listen to them on talking to others on the phone. I know th this had a lot to do with the sixties. I mean, the just revulsion that um, my generation. I'm a little old for them, but my generation and the and the one coming up after me, the sixties generation, found the manners, the external manners of educated you know, advantaged people revolting. I mean, just revoltingly phony. Mm -hmm. Just think about Holden Cole. What's his name? J.D. Salinger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the archetype. I mean, he just goes around and sees how phony all the grown-ups are. Mm -hmm. And it's not an accident that that book is, you know, was and is what it is. Uh, so, one of the drivers of the revolutions of the 60s of all kinds, whether they were political, Marxist, hardcore, or, you know, uh, new agey, expand your horizon, you know, all the straight, stra one thing they all had in common was just a, a, a almost disgusted rejection of the phoniness of external self-presentation and performance of the kind that, you know, we started with a little going on an airplane thing. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because it seems like there's more concern for what other people, th or maybe not more concern, but there was a lot of concern about status and the way that you appeared and the way, but I don't know that any of that's changed. Well, I don't think it's, it, I, it's changed maybe it's in the just, following sense. I think now you don't. You're not as likely to be worrying about whether you're wearing the appropriate clothes or, or saying, how do you do? But you're, you are really concerned with what people think about you, what mm. you are really like. And you want your authentic self to be known right. and recognized. So, again, it's an internalization of what used to be an external performance. And part of that dynamic is performing for yourself. Ugh, Even when you're alone, you're performing now. Can you explain that? And in, back in the day, they weren't. I just know they weren't. I watched them. You know, I watched them closely. And my poor grandfather, let alone my father. I, you talk him, about your grandfather in the, at the end of this yeah, chapter, no, and I love that, it. I, I asked him, he, he didn't even know what I was saying. <laughs> And a lot of a, a lot of older, you know, just the generation above me, the the, the the take it for granted that you get dressed when you go for an airplane. You know, it was kind of like I often got the impression that the person I was talking to thought I was gay, right? Because I wanted to know what you what you feel, right? What you really <laughs> like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and but my grandfather, he he almost literally didn't know what he what I was talking about. I mean, that's how unreflective he was. But again, is that, is it, is it a good thing? You know, is it, was it? I, a I, I really like so much in the book, like so much in the book. I, I, I hate to keep beating this drum, but there are really good things about it. Yeah. Without this, we'd never have the uh, growing tolerance for different styles of life or, mm -hmm. For gay couples, and you know, mm -hmm. the, the tolerance that we've got for compared to the intolerance of ages past, uh, that's a that's a large. Not there's a lot of other things going on, obviously, but one of the key factors driving that 
is the kind of reflexivity that we all developed about our, you know, ourselves. And in the process of kind of kind of figuring out who you are so that you can perform your who you really are better. I mean, what a paradox, right? Yeah. I want to know who I really am so I can give a better performance of what I really am. I don't think people think of it that way, though. No, but you know, that's I... what they're doing. Right. You to, to just talk to anybody who's seriously been through therapy about why they're better and how they're better. And, you know, you just tweak the lines a little bit and you'll find that they're saying, I found out who I really am now and I'm not afraid to be myself. And I say what, you know, and I don't yeah. pretend. And I don't. Well, that, that means that you are now, you know, feeling freer to perform who, what you really are. You can't, it can't not be a performance if you're that self-conscious about it. Mm. It's funny. There's my no therapy way to be that self-conscious right. and completely natural and authentic. Right. My grandfather was authentic because he didn't even know what it meant when I asked him what he was. Really <laughs> <about>. <laughs> In fact, you can build this around that paradox, the paradox of authenticity, you know, the, 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 the yammering about authenticity and, you know, being real and stuff. Yeah. I mean, to, to people who are really real, Talking about being really real. What? Yeah. What's your problem? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, that, that, that right there is the kind of cutting edge of this argument. Gold has soared past $2,000 an ounce, guys. Wars in Israel and Ukraine and rate cuts on the table are fueling gold's meteoric rise. There's a direct correlation to the national debt and price of gold. In 2020, the U.S. debt was $23 trillion and gold was $1,500 an ounce. In 2023, the debt is $33 trillion numbers. You cannot even get your mind around, and gold is over $2,000 an ounce. Donald Trump warned the U.S. dollar no longer being the world standard will be our greatest defeat in 200 years. Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention Bridget Phetasy, and you'll always get best-in-class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has a no-fee-for-life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the no-fee-for-life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Call 888-614-9238 for a free investor guide today. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer seven years in a row. Call 888-614-9238. Mention Bridget Phetasy. I think a lot about, I've been through a lot of therapy and have a great therapist. She's um, she's not from America, so she's a, a pretty different in that respect. Interesting. Interesting. And she's very um, Nordic in her kind of sensibilities, but you know, her father was in a prison camp somewhere and her, right. her she just comes from a different generation, but yeah. she's always asking. I like her because she's unorthodox and that she'll call me out on my shit. You know, most therapists yeah. are like, what do you think about that? And she'll be like, yeah, exactly. no, you're not doing that. That's a dumb idea. Um, right. <laughs> but really what we work a lot around and what I feel like in this chapter you refer back to quite often is, um, is it enough? You know, what is enough? Because this chapter was uncomfortable for me to read because I'm so in, Busy. I'm so in that. Yes. And there is that sense of addiction, but there were a lot of I, things in this I, chapter. I, I bet your, I bet your, I bet your therapist would, um, just judging from the little sketch, few lines of sketch you gave me, she would recognize something like Americans are so goddamn busy. Yes. She says this all the time. They can't afford to stop. Yeah. Because if they did, they wouldn't know who they were. Yeah, but also literally can't afford to stop. Well, that's <laughs> you know, yeah. there's yeah, like that. that. But the system's built like that. Right. I mean, people, you know, when I was, again, back in the day, a job, you were like, Oh, phew, it's the end of the day. Now I can go home and be me. But now you are your job. And big, the big thing you say, if you're quote unquote a happy, I love my job. 
I am literally my job. Yes, that's right. You know, I, I am, I am, yeah. if I, if I got hit but, by a know, bus, every this, brewery, this job every, stops every to exist. Every leading company in the, in the Western world, right, want, wants all their employees to live for their work. They want them to be yeah. so satisfied and deeply invested. And it's not enough to have them work really hard. They have to care. They have to, they have to really love their jobs. And, you know, most of the human resources workshops in the world are built around getting employees to be their jobs. Mm -hmm. And part of that, of course, ends up being you're being you're busy, busy, busy. Yeah. And I, I'm telling you, I just know this from hanging out with really busy, busy people. I've never been like that. I've never, I can't stand it. The only time I was ever busy, busy, busy was when I was waiting on tables and tending bar. Yeah. I love, I mean, yeah. that's what I actually liked about waiting tables yeah. is that I felt so, <laughs> I felt so yeah. present. I, I was, yeah. I was unable to check my phone. I was unable to, it that's was right. very yeah. much yeah. like yeah. Uh, table seven yeah. needs water, table yeah. six. I was always yeah. playing chess in yeah. my mind. Yeah. And then that, the, and, uh, and then it was over and, and then I'd have to, and then I'd have to roll silverware and I would want to lose my mind and go crazy and have an existential yeah. Yeah. crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And just so <laughs> you think about just you can really extend that dynamic to, you know, all the lucky people who have the groovy tech jobs and the wonderful, I, you know, the, the, the biodynamics, this and that jobs uh, where they all expect themselves and everybody else to be completely to be as into those jobs on purpose as you are when you're waiting on tables because you got no choice. Right. So being that busy is a way of being somebody that you can take for granted. And the reason we need that so much is because now going back to this inner reflexivity thing, the real us is such a problem of self-performance and self-fulfillment and who am I and what am I really like and all of that, you know, you, there's nothing about you that you can really, you, the inner, the so-called real, you, that you can take, you know, for granted. You're always on it. It's, you're always on. And no, I don't mean just you. No, I know. Obviously. Yeah. I, I mean, in some ways, I, this is a, something I have to really reconcile and grapple with on a pretty regular basis now that I've started my work and made it. I always wanted to build another brand, but inadvertently, I mean, I always knew we were all on our way to becoming brands. That's That was kind of the joke when I started this company before the Kardashians even existed. Yeah, yeah, but that's, per that's perfect. Exactly. But now I see, I used to joke and be like, oh, all these content creators, like why yeah. on YouTube yeah. having yeah. nervous breakdowns, what's their problem? And I'm like, I get it. I freaking yeah. get it. I understand yeah. why they have nervous breakdowns because they're yeah. the feeding the algorithm is relentless. Yeah. If you think yeah. like corporate America is relentless, try and feed the freaking YouTube algorithm for yeah. a, a yeah. job. Yeah. And people yeah. will say like, oh, it's a dream job and it's not work. And it's like, do you know, it is work though. Do you know what goes into yeah. these things? I watch these Instagram videos now that pe of people making food. And I'm like, oh my, one of my friends is one of the women, the woman behind the kind of everything is cake movement. I don't know if you caught any of that. <laughs> it was basically like this kind of hyper real She's a genius. She comes out of the art world, but she can make anything look like cake. And it got caught on during the pandemic, her videos, and she kind of blew up. But I, you know, my cousin Maggie and I, who make all of this content, what we're watching her videos and we were like, this is so much work. And I'm sure they have a rhythm and a routine, but just I know what goes into like those five minute videos yeah. for it. It's in. Sane. And then I, because yeah. I used to watch these workout girls and they'd have these breakdowns of like, what's your problem? Right. And right. now I have a lot more compassion for, for those people who are trying to do that. And I also understand from the perspective of people who are constantly telling me to get a real job. Um, I get that sentiment. I, I, I don't, 
I had a real job for many, many years, what they would consider a real job being manual labor on my feet. But even then it wasn't considered a real job by the people who had no, real no, jobs. No. The real jobs, no. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a real job. That's what you do to make a living while you're looking for your real job. I mean, the idea the of a real job is so is funny to me. That really, the one that's really expresses who you really are. That's is that what a real job is? Yeah. Like, I still have no well, idea what, what a real trying. job is. That's what they're trying for. That's what they're trying for. It reminds me of what you talk about, like real time. I was thinking about this, this weird, you know, well, okay, so what, what is a, what is a not an unreal job then? The, the list that you're talking about, the real, real, unreal, real. I mean, I, I can't remember it all, but I spell it all out. And I'm only half joking. Uh, the the um, that's how um, that's how subtle the 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 distinctions between the various kinds of real realness have, have become. Yeah. Uh, and the only and then what are the point I try to make it as clear as I can in the, the this part of the book is the only real real things are accidents. Some accident happens to you you yeah. break down the, my favorite example is you know, you're driving through saskatchewan all by yourself on a lonely country road and your car breaks down you don't have a cell phone you just have to sit there that's when you notice the grass that's when you really notice the clouds you'll notice all the little pebbles on the road every single one of them is entitled to exist as you are completely ignored, having no reason to be, nobody's looking at them. They're, they're just there. <laughs> they're, not, they're not there to look at. They're not showing anything. They're just there. You just reminded me That's of something. Real. That's the real real. Okay? Yeah. And we, we approach being real real in moments of accident, awful accidents accidents or happy accidents but uh, something accidental that sweeps you up if you've ever been in a bad car accident you'll you'll know what i mean yeah uh, anything like, like that boom, boom, boom oh god i mean so, you know and you know it's very much linked with the fact that you can't press any buttons mm -hmm. you know there's no buttons there's no mute there's no unmute there's no nothing there's no channel to change. There's no call to take or not take. There's no CC to read or not read. Mm -hmm. I mean, all this started, I think I've said this before on your show. I'm, just, I'm sorry, but it's so important to me that this is how I was. I wouldn't get an answering machine. When I oh, yeah, that's in this it. chapter. Yeah. And I mean, I just didn't want a fucking answering machine to come <laughs> home with it. The light going, and you know, I just wanted to come home. Yeah. I don't want to outside, you know, if the phone rings, I answer it. If I don't want the, per I'm too bad for me. You know, if I don't know who it is, I don't know who it is. I have to just answer it. That's like a little accident. You know, now, of course, you, oh, I'm not going to talk to her. Options, options, options. Unreality equals options equals blobby equals uh, reality equals no options accidents happening to you and da 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 and um, people got dressed up to go on airplanes I mean, back in the days of external performance uh, that was when the world was so much less in your control because it was quote unquote the real world and not the screen world I mean, the amount of time we spend not just on the screen world, but on that uh, margin between the screen world and the real world. Yeah. Here we are together at dinner. Oh, just a second. Oh, look, it's Patty. See? I mean, I that, wrestle with this with little, my daughter. A little dog soon, you know. I wrestle with this. She, all of her grandparents are out of state, so she FaceTimes them. But now she's spending time on a screen, and we'll take... We'll take videos of her. That's a good example of what I, speaking as a grandfather who gets lots of FaceTimes with his grandchildren that he wouldn't otherwise see. 
when you when you always ask me, is it good or bad? You know, and the, the, this is an area where I'd say it's mostly good. Right. Except I mean, she's very good. Yeah, exactly. Self-aware. Yeah, in a way that a little too much. You know, it's mostly good. She. Lo- I took a video of her the other day being, she was <laughs> playing with a phone and she was like, hello, hello. Yeah, and go. it's hilarious. Yeah. And then she <clears throat> wants to watch it. Yeah. She and I don't know if she realizes that it's her yet because she's only eighteen months, but she's just yeah. fascinated with yeah. this video and she wants to watch it over and over and yeah. over again. She and I'm like, she, "What is this doing?" She kind thing? of knows. There's mirrors around. She knows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so, just you know. Well, there was this. So this is what I thought of when you were talking about being stuck in Saskatchewan, wherever that is, um, Saskatchewan. Uh, she, there was this video that went viral last week and it was a person, there's this whole new kind of genre of videos on TikTok that we would call like Gen Z discovers. And this week they discovered silent walking and it was this woman taping herself. So she's still self reflecting, but she's talking about how her boyfriend who clearly must've been like over the age of 40 (laughs) dared her to go on a walk without her device and not tape it and not have her headphones Mm -hmm. in. And, and she talks about how she discovered her inner monologue. And I was like, how is this any different? What's interesting is we've almost come full circle. So the generation that your grandfather was, who was not really aware of his inner monologue because he didn't have therapy and wasn't Mm -hmm. reflecting and didn't Mm -hmm. know what he, Mm -hmm. now this generation is so plugged in. They don't, they're shocked when they discover they have an inner monologue. She's talking about how she's like, I just hear my thoughts. Yeah. But that's a, yeah. Again, it's really important to distinguish between the shocking realization that you have an inner monologue in the sense that you're describing it with this, (laughs) she's walked like this is a big this is like a novelty for her but 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 what what the what inner monologue means in this con that context is a uh a sense of them of themselves that isn't immediately completely infected with images of how she they should be and how they were and how they are and how other people are in other words when you saying in a monologue in that context, it's the real the, the woman is realizing that she has a separate inner self, <laughs> not and one this- that's you know fused completely with all the shit she's constantly consuming, mm-hmm. which becomes part of her inner self as a mediated person. That's what it means to be mediated. Yeah, there's a line in here where you talk about how our brains have been colonized, basically by. Yeah, that's it. All of I mean, this. Friend, like, I mean, an old friend of mine, and I think he's gone now, but, uh, you know, he resisted this whole, he was making a career in media and education, and he really didn't like, <laughs> he didn't want to hear, he didn't want to listen to what I was, was saying. He, he wanted it all to be good, you know. And uh, I remember him finally, it was really gratifying for me, in, in some conversation, he said, I'm not going to be able to die without performing my death. What does that mean? And it means he's going to, oh, I'm dying now. This is the death scene. Oh. Uh, right. How am I going to How am I going to play myself dying? Well, this kind of asks, there's a couple of lines in this that I needed you to explain to me because I'm, I just am not smart enough. Summing up performative habitualities in a mediated adulthood that dims down the horizon of options through immersion in a numbing routine allow many of us to feel reflexively real. Can you just yeah. break that that's sentence part, down for me? Of bit busy. That's the part of the busy, busy thing. Mm-hmm. If you, if you, just think about what you said about with the waiting on tables, because that was really just so right. And if you're really busy and wait, you know, waiting tables, you don't have to choose much of any, you know, do I, shall I take out the steak before I bring the pudding to the other table or shall I have, you know, that kind of, that's it. Your range of options is like nothing. Yeah. And you are more or less entirely driven by the necessities of the moment. Yes. 
And the I necessities have exactly the same quality as accidents have. Namely, they're not in your control. They're not options, not unless mm-hmm. you want to get fired. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. if you're going to do the job, you just, up comes the burger, out goes, oh, God, I forgot the mail, keep going, you know. And you're just busy. You're so goddamn busy. You don't have room to be reflexive. Uh huh. I wonder if that's why, like, people who are in service have those nightmare dreams forever about being in the weeds. I still, like, I still dream about. I still, of course, I did it for a long time. But I me still, too. I, I still have dream, dreams. But people who are working like desk jobs aren't dreaming yeah. they're in the weeds. <laughs> um. Depends on depends on the job. I bet yeah. the people I bet the people who are constantly answering telephones, yeah, have dreams about with that. Very similar questions, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but 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 anyway, the the necessities of that kind have the same have the same quality that accidents have, in that they remove the reflexive distance between you and whatever it is you are at that moment, whatever you're mm-hmm. doing. You lose, for that moment, the field of options that's normally around you when you, as, as you live as a mediated person, that is to say, half in what we used to call the real world and half in what we'll call the representational world, both of which now have fused to the extent that they are the world we live in. And so you, the world we live in is now full of buttons, and that's just shorthand for Choices, options. Only it's not. <laughs> it's not. Shall I take table seven's dessert out before I bother with the steak for table one? It's um, which aspect of myself <laughs> do I feel like celebrating? <laughs> you know, which part of me am I inclined at the moment to fulfill and express or escape from? Or whatever. In other words, you, you, in other words, you, you've got choices, buttons for fairly deep psychological stuff. So, and again, I going back to the comparison with the external manners of the bourgeoisie in the fifties. Uh, you're, you're, you know, you you're choosing between versions of yourself that you're constantly playing. Hmm. I had this well, moment. Now yes. I'm going. Now I'm going to be a mommy. I was just thinking this because I had this <laughs> moment yesterday in the kitchen, where I was with my daughter and my in laws are in town and they're staying with us. And I was like, "Am I acting right?" You know, I I, 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 yeah, felt, yeah. I had this moment where I felt like I was playing a mom, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was yeah, like, "Am I just right. turning it on because my in laws yeah. are here?" Yeah. And I might be, but it was yeah. this very strange moment of like, "Am I?" playing at being a good mom right now or am I like this all the time or am I just being this way because there's observers I would put it to you that in a much more subtle way than the when in the presence the actual presence of your real in-laws there there is a constant kind of critic monitor in your head that is in a much subtler way is, is saying you know um Am I just playing mom now? Am I really listening to little whatever her name is? Yeah. Uh, or am I, you know, am I? So, so you're, again, you, the, the amount of self-consciousness that goes into just going through your daily life now, just because you can't help it because you're, you're constantly looking at reflections of yourself literally reflections of yourself, but also other people saying and doing things that overlap with what you say and do and therefore reflect on you in one way or another, even though they're not you. I mean, that's what you constantly, I don't watch fucking TikTok or, you know, but you know, the, the, one of, one of the mo you know, driving forces for Instagram and all that stuff is comparing yourself to these others in the mirrors of the Instagram posts, mm-hmm. you know, that's a process of self, that's a process of self-construction that you're unconsciously carrying out all day long. 
It's weird too. The this week or the past couple of weeks in particular, um, you you pointed to something that I've been thinking. I I forgot to tell you too. By the way, side note, I quoted you in an article that I wrote, or I quoted your your book in an article I wrote, um, Justin about Justin's helmet principle. I'll send it to you. <laughs> It was all about all of the choices that I had to make becoming a new geriatric mom and like the endless amounts of choices that you are given and evaluating whether or not this is, you know, I joke in the piece and I can, I could just see my daughter being like, oh, my friends are going to live forever because you were too cheap to, you know, freeze my cord (laughs) blood, mom. Like now I won't live forever. Thanks a lot. Um, and it's just, you just don't, it's so weird in the technology world. You just don't know, but I, I'll send you the piece. Uh, okay, I good. liked the way it came out. It was an actual magazine too. So yeah, I always like that. Work. Good work. I'm Walter Masterson. And I'm Maximilian Clark. And we're basically journalists. No, no, we're not. Well, we do travel across America and interview people. Yeah, using God to solve murders, and it's, it's proven communication. Tell me, wait, tell me everything about that. But we also dress up like extremists and sneak into their protests. I care about children. That is why I pay my court-mandated child support. Well, that's undercover journalism. Okay, and that time we pretended to be Trump's legal team during the indictment? Trump loves America. He's, he considers us all family. That's why he's always asking us for money. Okay, so we are not journalists. We're TikTok comedians asking questions real journalists are too smart to ask. But we also talk to real experts and scientists and smart people and stuff. And make fun of them. Yeah, I guess that's why we named our show We Are Not Journalists. Because we're better. We have a podcast. A podcast that's available on whatever podcast app you use to get your podcasts. Podcast. Podcast. Um, but this piece, but I was thinking about you because this, there's another piece that I've been kind of fumbling around in my brain and wrestling with, particularly in light of the October 7th stuff in Israel and all the images I've been taking in and how weird it is on Twitter. I just said this yesterday on a podcast to see like a, a horrific image of usually a dead baby. And then someone talking about how they hate having pineapple on pizza. But it, when I was reading this chapter, it reminded me of of this um, this mm-hmm. line in particular, where you say, "A hint of a sigh, a slight shake of the head, eyes downturning, the note of seasoned resignation, profound respect is thus conveyed for the abandoned topic." even as a note of anticipation rises to welcome the also interesting but less burdensome next topic and a cut to a new camera angle back at the anchor desk makes clear that a stern and external necessity rather than any human agency governs the shift from two minutes on mass starvation to three minutes on Janet Jackson's tit. But Mm. now with scrolling, we don't even need, we don't even, so good. Beautiful. You're such a good writer. (laughs) But now we don't even, first of all, we don't, we often don't consent to what images we're seeing because we're scrolling. That's right. That's right. And secondly, there's no human person who's acknowledging that transition. That's right. that's it's right. just read about pineapple on yeah, pizza right. and then that's, that's why I make such dead an baby. issue. That's why I make <laughs> such an issue out of this idea of what we used to think of as real reality fusing with representational reality into a new plane of, of a new kind of world that we live in that we can't help but live in. I mean, unless you take quiet walks forever. <laughs> no, no, I mean, people do. People drop out. People really do. I want to drop yeah. out. I, I said this to my editor. You know, it, it, it can be done. But, you know, most of this stuff, and even then, I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is that even then, the person all by themselves in a hut with just what they need to maintain, you know, food, water, no media at all, I, I, if, they, if they grew up in this world and they unplugged after they were 15 or something, I, I God, I might. Well, every instinct in my body tells me that 10 years after they unplug, they're still walking around performing their unpluggedness. 
I mean, this is my obsession with the homesteading movement. So there's a whole online homesteading movement and there are all these Luddites who are like, we're canning our food and I go down these rabbit holes and I'm like, but you're still online performing and actually make, this is how you make your money is performing, being a homesteader. But this, you're not including all the fucking work that goes into being an actual homesteader. And even, I'm even, even without that part, even if they really are alone and they're not, you know, they're not, they're not showing themselves at all. They're really not. I don't think it's possible after the conditioning of this. Mm. To ju- I mean, I, I don't know how long it would take to really just <laughs> be there like a stone for my grandfather. I, I don't know how long it would take to get rid of the idea that, oh, I'm unplugged and authentic now. Look at But isn't that the whole idea of meditation is to kind of get outside of and, that and, matrix and, of and, your own and, and, mind? In, a, in, in ways that I've recently, not practicing, unfortunately, but I've been thinking and reading about it a lot. I, I, I think the goals of meditation, although they involve uh, abstracting yourself, not just from the mediated world, but the humanly, med- you know, the, the, the humanly constructed world, uh, the world of habits and categories and, you know, concepts that are, you inherit as a person in society, uh, of, of, of Abandoning those and somehow being with or being in whatever is left over after all the, not media now, but all the human categories and concepts that we, you know, no matter what culture or society we're in, it doesn't have to be mediated, uh, that we live in. The ultimate origin of mediation is language itself. Mm. And I just allude to this very briefly in the book. At one point, I was thinking of you know going on with this before I changed my mind. And but I, I, you know, language itself imposes you know itself on your experience and forces you to live through categories that you didn't create. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're, you know, smart and reflexive, you, you can use them. That's what poets and writers do, you know, and you can make them your own to some extent. But, you know, normal, or, ordinary normal people don't do that. And um, so mediation is part of the human condition, if you want to think of it as going all the way back to language. Again, what's what's happening now is we know it. When people just grow up in a regular society before the me- the media, they don't think of their languages as mediating between them and the world. They just talk. Right. But now, because this world is so mediated and we're so reflexive and aware of it, we're not only totally mediated, but we know we're totally mediated at some level. And, and, and we sort of collaborate with... Um, the condition of life uh, in a world where you have to perform to be. What do you think it's doing to us that, you know, you talk about that shift from two minutes of starvation to Janet Jackson's tip, but now that's been condensed to scrolling just quickly through. What is your, what is your kind of guess or take or thoughts on, on hey, again, don't, don't forget to tell people about the last chapter which is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> I have no solutions. The title is, uh, <laughs> I, w- I will not be providing you with any bogus explanations or predictions about what this all means. But um, because that's a genre requirement. If you write a book of social criticism, your editors and your agents, they're going to insist that you tell people what this all means. Uh, yeah. Trust me, Thomas, yeah, I'm running it. It's why I haven't sold a book because they there all want go. me to go and go. tell okay. people to vote this there, way there or tell go. people to. A, diag- a diagnosis is not sufficient. You have to cure it or at least explain it to the point where people will feel like, like they can set it aside. This is why poor Semmelweis went insane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but having said that, I, 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 I'll, I keep returning to this. I'm sorry I keep returning to this. But I, it's, uh, 
it's a mixed curse and blessing. One way, one way I think of this again. It's it. Uh, I think of the kids that I taught, and when I was teaching high school, a little bit with the university, but not not so much. You see it in high school more. And of course, it was a good private school. I was, I was I'm not talking about a, but uh, by and large, and on the whole, those kids were compared to what it was like when I was a 10th grader or 11th grader, what life was like. Those kids are caring. They're decent. And by decent, I don't mean sexually decent. I mean, they're considerate of others mm -hmm. to a degree that would just be unthinkable when I was in school, when I was 15 or 16. Mm. I mean, you, you, you thought of your friends, but, uh, the general impression I have is that most young people today who've lived through all of this that we're talking about and live with it are pretty damn good compared to what we were like. Yeah, although then there's looking at like the accelerating levels of depression and anxiety, and I'm I'm not sure if that that's... May, that may that there may be a a deep connection to that to that it may be that. Uh, people are less likely to get depressed or anxious if they're absolutely certain about stuff. If they know what it means to be a man or they know <laughs> how to be a woman and they know what they're doing and they know queers are queer and uh, you know, you just know shit. Whereas if you don't know shit like that, basic stuff like that, if those categories aren't clearly defined for you and you have to improvise your way through a world in which those categories are constantly, fluidly morphing in various ways, uh, that could cause a lot of confusion. And to that degree, I think the conservative idiots who, whom I loathe with the, bot with the bottom of my heart uh, are right. It is, in fact, disconcerting. <laughs> uh, for people to grow up in a world without clearly defined categories, mm. to which I say tough shit. We want better people, not secure people. But I do think that a lot of insecurity attends the fluidity of categories. Yeah, there's that that phrase. So open minded, your brain falls out. Which is what? Which is fluidity of, of categories? Which is inseparable from our self-consciousness about who we are and what we are. And, uh, you, you can't be aware. In anthropology, I used to say the last, the last lecture is, was like, do you want to know exactly what's going on and be total, a total, totally secure, but a complete idiot? Or, or do you want to be unsure of everything and not be sure of anything and be close to the truth and anxious? What would you rather be, safe and wrong or free and anxious? That seems very minimized. Like, that seems very, like, simplistic, it I is. think. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mnemonic device. Yeah, because there are, are plenty of people. I mean, I look at right now in this moment as we speak what's happening to a lot of my very progressive left-wing friends who happen to be Jewish. And mm -hmm. I don't think that they would necessarily say that they feel the same way, not that they're now conservatives, but I wouldn't say that they necessarily feel like people on the on, progressives are just right all the time about everything, no, no, maybe no. in the way that they did feel I, I, at I, one I, time. Uh, the progressives who are always right, who are always right, always have been, in my mind, uh, phony progressives. Interesting. The, what I would call the real progressive, Richard Rorty, just for your audience, he's the great, and he writes in a regular English, you know, he's a philosopher, but he writes for people. Um, the big challenge is to learn how to live in a world of doubt 
Mm -hmm. and to take decisive action Mm. without thinking or feeling that you're absolutely certain that you're right. Mm. How do you live? How do you do that? How do you do both? Yeah, I'm pretty certain I'm a moron. I have a harder time taking decisive (laughs) action. (laughs) I'm very, I'm very certain of that. Even though people will, people get upset and say like, "Oh, you're too self-deprecating." When you you call yourself a moron and all that, which you do frequently enough, so that I think your shrink has probably commented on it. Yeah, Uh, yeah. Um, What do you do? You do you really mean that you're not a highly educated intellectual? Is that what that means? I mean, I'm not a highly you're educated. Obviously smart. You don't mean you don't mean you don't mean you're dumb. What do you mean when you say that? I mean that I'm very aware of how much I don't know, and that even if I can take information in, and I'm not a highly educated intellectual. I did not go to a higher elite institution. That's what I, I'm saying. I think you've got a little. This is just me guessing. I think you. I think you're so smart that there's a little v- space in your head that isn't full of the things that it would be full of if you read a lot more really serious stuff and discussed it with really serious people. And I think you're you miss that. Maybe, but then I also look around and go, or would I just be a self righteous douchebag? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where the doubt comes in. You know the first person in the world. Who's, you know the first famous person in the world who says, "I'm the wisest there is because I know I don't know anything because I know I don't know." Uh, who, the Delphic who? Oracle declared that Socrates was the wisest man in Athens because he knew he didn't know. Right. I but I he don't took decisive action anyway. Right, and I think that's where I I you know I hear from a lot of my the people who criticize me for being kind of captain of the fence riding team or miss wishy-washy or whatever. I understand that criticism because I, because I can, I think what happened, what's happened is somebody who didn't go to uh, have like a formal education is that mine has been quite informal, which is not a bad thing, No, but there's, there were still big gaps in, in my education and places where I didn't have, and I don't, and again, I don't know that this actually happens in elite institutions. I don't know if I had grown up in my only, liberal. It, it, it only happens if you grab it. It right. doesn't happen for most people in it. But you, Yeah, I don't know that I would have had my ideas challenged. It, elite institutions have this going for them. If you want to, everything you need is there. Right. Including people who are really who if they take three looks at you and decide you're for real will invest a lot of their energy in helping you. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it's, it's just as my, my therapist would say, it's like, a uh, what's the word? Um, just an insecurity about not going to college, you know, right. just, uh, this, well, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, Some I mean, of the yeah, biggest well, I, morons I know well, went to college, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> well, they're the worst morons of all because, of course, they think mm-hmm. they know it. That's I, what I, I mean. I, I wonder if I would just be I like a very the confident big, the biggest moron. morons are the ones who did have all this elite yeah. education, and now they think they know shit. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. I no, I think I would be. No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> You are I much feel like- too profoundly insecure for that ever to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> See, insecurity is good. That's Keeps right. you in your place. That's what I, I said. I mean, my, my yeah. husband and I talk about this a lot because we both came from recovery and we met in recovery, but we both have a lot of self-doubt in general and are profoundly insecure and always feeling like imposters. But in, I think when you come from that, when you recover from addiction and you you are very familiar with the ways in which you can lie to yourself yeah. and others, yeah. Yeah. in order to get sober, you have to face that. Yeah. It leaves a lot of just, dist- even though I'm like, okay, I'm on mm. the right path. There's a part of me that's like, I could be full of shit. Yeah. Even yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I don't, yep. there's a lot of distrust yep. that comes from. This is what I would call really understanding Socrates as opposed to just, just the description you just gave. This is what he really meant. I mean, I know that I, I can, I also know even in sobriety, how much as the kids these day, days would say is a cope. So even as I've gotten older and looked at my rah, rah female empowerment and my like, I don't need a man and I don't want a baby and none of that stuff has any meaning. And then having a nice relationship and have being a mom, I'm like, wow, I was profoundly full of shit. I mean, part of it probably was true at the time, but it was also my own fear, sadness over not having, having that. And yeah, looking well, at that you, stuff you in the got, faces, that's uncomfortable. Got, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you got, you got it all covered. I just, um, uh, I don't know how to put it. I'm not, yeah, I, I'm not in a position to say this stuff. Uh, yeah, you are. So, any, so, so anyway, busy, busy, busy. Just to go back to the super busy people. I'm looking for something that I underlined. Oh, God, you can spend your whole uh, life online and never leave your own head. I mean, that's tr that you said this in 2006. Imagine yeah. how bad this is now. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I said to my friend, my editor is asking me what I'm writing a column about this month. And I'm like, I feel so fucked up right now. I feel like, and I know I've been spending too much time online taking in all, all of the image, like atrocities and images and trying to make sense of a very complex issue that I don't know anything about, but also just seeing rising anti-Semitism everywhere in the world and being terrified of that. Yeah. I, and I, I don't know. I, like, I just feel like a crazy person. And I know that the th solution would be to just log out and, <laughs> and act like none of it's happening, <laughs> which yeah, I could do. You yeah, know, there's that's, that. That's, that's not your, that's not you. But I don't know how people are doing. You know, the, this, this chapter to me, I feel like all of these chapters, when I read your book, it's that on steroids. So now, because all my friends are so busy, you try and make plans yeah. People don't have dinner parties anymore. Yeah. 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 They're they're not. I've been reading that book, Bowling Alone, for yeah. my little fantasy yeah. book club. Yeah, that seems quaint. Yeah, it's yeah, that is quaint. Um, the the uh, the um, I mean, he, he back then when he thought about what he meant by community is you know he's thinking about the Boy Scouts and Elks and whatnot. You know, he's just yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it seems so, adorable. So, uh, so um, I mean, it was a right, a interesting thing to say at the time, but not. It's not. You know, it didn't. It didn't have legs. It wasn't taking uh, all the social, all the social criticism of that era that wasn't taking account of the of what the rise of media were were, were doing to the sort of take it for granted wisdom of the left. Um, made this same mistake. I mean, they just don't understand the problem of creating or maintaining authentic communities when they're riddled with mediation from every direction in the world. They just, they just can't do it. And I think the word it's community itself has been subject yeah. to the process of mediation because people sure. will say, I'm part of the gay community, but yeah. the gay community isn't going to show up and bring you soup they, when you're they, sick. They, they, even, they even go, they even go, uh, they even go, uh, what did I read? Some guys, the, he, they were talking about spies and he was in the intelligence community. They, they were literally talking about professional spies from <laughs> different, you know, countries as being a community because, they, right. you know, I, uh, whatever. No, these words just uh, run away with people's heads. Um, but anyway, the busy, busy thing, I just want to get back to the thing that wait, because that, to me, the linchpin of this conversation has been your recollection about what it's like to be super busy as a waitress. And what I'm trying to get across with the busy, busy, busy thing in general in that chapter is that an ideal of busyness has emerged along with these media so that people can 
glide over or past or not feel the constant barrage of insults of options that make make it more or less impossible to know what the hell's going on or who you are or what to do by staying really busy. Mm. And I, I had a very illuminating period. I was doing some consulting work with a team of educators who were working on the new media in the classroom, things to do in classes with digital technologies. And um, I was invited to be on this in this group because I was known to be a good teacher, but, and, but also I was just skeptical of the idea. The basic idea was, oh, they'll have everything. The kids will have everything. They can do anything they want, they, you know. And I said, hey, you know, that's not how you educate anybody, let alone a kid. You, know, you have yeah. to create a space of parameters that make it possible to make sense of something. It's, you just throw them in the pool. <laughs> so uh, I remember, and I went to, I did things I never did for myself and my own academic you know i went to conferences you know i sat on panels i did all that shit i did as part of that job and i remember after you know you'd go for somewhere in new orleans in this hotel and then, then it was five o'clock and oh let's go look at you know so the four of us would sort of wander out in the street and look at the slave quarters or something and and look in the windows and i could I was kind of going, oh, let's stop. Let's just sit here, you know. And I could tell on the faces of my three friends who, and they were friends. I'm not, I'm not dissing them. They were genuine friends. But I could tell on their faces that they were, the absence of stimulation. They were, they were like, uh, I mean, yeah. the quiet walk was just not on their agenda. They couldn't have a quiet walk without without getting into some kind of a panic. I mean, they they, they had to be doing something. Yeah. And, I mean and I and and so that the busyness of waiting on tables is duplicated at levels of highly educated people who work 24-7, 12, 12 months out, you know, because they want to, they think. I mean, or, and they do. But the, my argument is that they don't just want to because of what they're producing and doing has the, this kind of value. for, But it allows them to escape the kinds of dilemmas that you and I are talking about around the book. Mm -hmm. it's a, it becomes a way to avoid the not knowing of Bridget Phetasy and Socrates. <laughs> 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 no, you get that little those few sentences. You would look at him and you, you, you just got exactly what he's saying. He says, "Oh, it's not. It's not like a. Oh, I can't name all the capitals of all the countries in the Mediterranean." He didn't, when he said, "I don't know," I'm not. He, he didn't mean that. He meant, "I don't know what the fuck is going on." And that's what he meant. Yeah. People oftentimes the kinds of intellectuals you're afraid you might become if you. Had gone to a higher education, you know, the ones who know, you know, they just think he means, oh, it's a vo value. If you're going to learn something, then you have to realize that you don't know it in the, you know, it's that it turned into this kind of like formula for learning. He wasn't talking about that kind of, well, it was that too, but he was talking about what it means to live a life of doubt. Mm. Am I profoundly full of shit? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, I mean, and and that, you know, that's what he was asking himself. <laughs> I, 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 you. I just love reading this book. It just so makes me think and makes me, it's very highbrow sometimes for me. I have to really stop. And I say this probably every time where I'll have to break down a sentence because I'm not fully sure I can even grasp, grasp it and get my mind around it. And it's because I do wonder, and I know people like yourself and, and others have, you know, contemplated what mediation is doing to us. But as I sit here 
and this is the essay I was kind of tossing around is I had to do this show. I was doing this show and it was with a bunch of comedians and it's hard to joke. It was kind of right on the heels of everything of October 7th. So it was an awkward time to try and be light and funny. And yet it was still kind of our job in that moment. But we were talking before and they were all kind of joking and it was like this aside of like dead baby Twitter, they kept calling it, you know, it was like, we were all like, oh, well, at least we won't be on dead baby Twitter for a couple of hours. And just that flattening, yeah. you know, just the, 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 it's a coping mechanism, obviously, yes, yes, yes. clearly, but it's yeah. also just, that's right. That's right. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It's doing something. Yeah, no, it's. True. But I'm not sure what. You well, know, I'm not- what I was trying to get at, not as concisely as you just did, when I was talking about the, we get back to the anchor desk who sternly reassures us that four minutes on Gaza can now be replaced by three minutes on what? Yeah, Gal- and you're supposed Gal- to just go cook fucking dinner? Yeah. You and, then you, <laughs> and then you cook dinner. You know? Like... <laughs> Yeah. I'm supposed to, and this is that weird, this is what I, this is the part of your book that's really starting to, uh, I'm starting to truly internalize of, of living in that like half world. Like there I feel, go. I there feel like go. I have one foot Good. in one world there you go. and I actually think the, the people who are very online and the people, because now I live in the suburbs with people who are not very online. If they are, it's like Instagram. It's not this like Thunderdome of yeah. X or Twitter or whatever, or the disc, the discourses it's called. Um, they're not living and breathing this stuff. And I actually seem, it seems like there's like a tear occurring, like people who are, uh, the people who are very online seem to be accelerating into another reality and the people who are more grounded and and uh, the the real life offline are they feel like they're getting further apart which is a also mm. a very weird phenomenon because mm. i'm i'm kind of in this weird in between, in between. I, I i haven't experienced this that's interesting is that what uh, you're going to write about uh yeah i'm going to try because i don't i don't really know uh, if you, again if you get anecdotes that you could tell to illustrate that yeah it would make a great article. Yeah, just I mean, just even talking to my neighbors, that's it's, it's that's like I mean. we're talking about the price of food and people yeah. they're talking about those more real life things and like, oh, you know, did you see the rain? It flooded yeah, yeah. our backyards. Like yeah. not and then I go online and it's like it, it it's it's definitely it's almost like there's a whole other reality. Yeah, but and then is there you know, let me like start you know, your, your, your question that you is, is it a good thing? I mean, is it a good thing to be just worried about the price of eggs in the puddle in your yard? Does that lead to a good life? I don't know that it's... Or, a, you, or, a, you, or, you, or are you ducking your responsibilities as a citizen of the world? Mm, yeah, I mean, the, the desire to, like, throw my phone into the ocean seems to ebb and flow. Yes. And this... <laughs> <laughs> it's like the tide and it feels yeah. right now like a, a full, a full moon tide. Yeah. But then it, so this is something that, and I know you have to go, it's just this, 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 um, the thing I'm trying to balance or, or write about or process is this witnessing versus rubbernecking is the only way I can explain it. That's you a know, beautiful distinction. Am I, am I, especially I with like growing up with a distinction? Thank you. Um, well, witness, it, has, witness carries these, you know, religious connotations, not a specific religion, but you know, you bear witness. Uh, yeah. Do a different thing from rubbernecking, even though you're not doing anything. Which feels very lizard brain and human. So yeah. it's, and this is the weird thing of being online right now, as I pull away from it, I'm, I, and coming from a, the generation that was raised under the, in the shadow of the Holocaust, you know, a couple of generations down, there was always this refrain, like never again, don't turn away. We don't turn away. We don't yeah. look away. Yeah. So there's a part of me that's, and I don't want to turn away from the suffering in Gaza either. So yeah. I, I, it's like, I want, I don't want to not witness this because this is how atrocities yeah. Yeah. occur. But at the same time, like there's an icky feeling that rises. 
That's right. Where I'm like, this is also rubbernecking. That's like right. I, I that's know cool. that right. there's a lizard brain part of me that's just right. morbidly curious. Well, you're, you're, you're there again. You, I understand now what you mean by internalizing this idea of a foot, foot in both worlds. You know, the fusing of these two worlds. I mean, you really are experience, experiencing what I was trying to get at when you talk like that. It's also, you know, it's it's impossible to bear witness without rubbernecking mm. under these mediated conditions. But it's I, not I, the I, same. It's not the same, no. It's not the same as going to a Holocaust site and no. seeing the sh- tangible shoes and the, the, shoes. the, the, the heaviness shoes. and the gravity and the yeah. luggage and the, mm-hmm. the material things that left. It's like... Online, it's diff. It's different. It's no, a different not, kind of witnessing. I know, I know, I know, but it's still a show. Yeah, there's a little thing in the book, isn't there, about if you really want your kids to never forget, look, look for it. Yeah, I think we're if getting you to really that chapter. Want your kids to never forget. Here's how to do it. You remember that part? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's in the. I think so it's in I our never upcoming. Never let them see an image of anything. Not a shoe. Nothing until they're 13 or 17 or whatever. And then once take them into a vault with the most vivid depictions of the horrors of the Holocaust, just once, never again. They never forget. And that's what I worry though, is that seeing all of this mixed up with pineapple pizza that's tweets the thing. That's the is thing. that that's it beca- that's you the, become desensitized that's, that's, to it that's the point of my little thing there. Yeah. it actually makes us more bloodthirsty that's the, why I, that's why i made that little uh, faux suggestion yeah. of it. i had to get it away from the pineapples yeah all right all right, all right i Bridget. adore you um, thank you so much listen, listen listen kiddo if you want to send me a draft or whatever of any article you're working on or whatever and it wouldn't be I'm a teacher. I know how not to tell you what I would say if I were to say. In other yeah. words, I would try to help you say what you're trying to say. That would be amazing. If you if you would like me to look stuff over and comment, I'd be happy to do it. I would love that. And I will send you um, that article that I think they put up digitally now of that I talk about Justin Talmud principle, and hopefully <laughs> I got it right. <laughs> All right. All right, kid. All right. Thank you. Of course. Of course. My pleasure. It's always my pleasure. Take care. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Hold on to your jingle bells. Pluto TV has all your holiday favorites for free. Enjoy our season's greetings category with nine holiday channels, including holiday movie favorites by Lifetime, Festive Fireplace, Holiday Lights, and Hallmark Movies and more. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming holiday favorites on live channels and on demand with thousands of free movies and TV shows. Pluto TV is your home for the holidays. Pluto TV. Stream now, pay never. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. All right. Well, we're in housekeeping mode. We're in major housekeeping mode for the end of the year. Okay. So for people who subscribe, we've moved our domain. Yes. Fetacy.com. Which is a major project. Yes. And now it's pointing to our sub stack. So if you are a local subscriber and you're wondering what happened to locals, if you go to fetacy.com, just go to fetacy.locals.com and you will be able to go there. Yes. You'll be able to log in and the community is there as usual. And they Nothing haven't has disappeared. And if you're not a subscriber, why not join <laughs> us over on Substack? We moved... We moved the domain. We were going, it's a long story. I won't bore you with. Anyway, it points there now. Everything we need is now at Substack because they also moved into the video space. So now they have video and podcasting and they also have writing. writing. Basically, we could put everything we do in one place, which has been the dream for a very long time. Because we've been chasing the dream, guys. (laughs) We've been chasing the dream since 2006. And... (laughs) I have been chasing the tech around the wild west of the, the internet. internet. Yep. And first I went to Patreon because it was the first. Well, I built a subscriber site. And because I'm an idiot in 2006 and didn't think big enough, I didn't think to include other people. And that is why I am not a billionaire now. <laughs> 
Right. One of the many reasons. Also, n- not creating my YouTube channel when I when I was a youngster, although that probably wouldn't have gone over very well. <laughs> no, probably not. Um, and so I went to Patreon, started a subscriber site there. Then they started canceling people for going on other podcasts and it got dodgy. And then I went to Locals and Locals was great with video and is great with video and they have live streaming, which I don't use that much. So for people who live stream, I think it's great. And then Rumble, but local, uh, always these places are being gobbled up. This is the thing about tech or going public or whatever when you're on the forefront and I've actually, again, the Substack creator i think he emailed me like in 2007 to start a substack so probably would be 2017 i mean 2017 so probably would be you know pretty have a huge substack had i (laughs) but the deal terms we laugh so we don't cry (laughs) no i mean it wasn't it was a different percentage it was different back then yeah when they were starting and and i was already on patreon and I was like, why would I take a, you know, why would I leave there and take a different cut? And now I'm there and have been there for about two years now, two Mm -hmm. years writing there. And but then because part of the problem of being a small independent creator, always dodging shadow bands and getting censored for saying something about covid or whatever is that you're trying always to kind of diversify so that not everything is in one place right so that you're you're not dependent on one income stream where if if something happens which i've done a great job of too good of a job of because now i'm confusing everyone (laughs) if in case you haven't noticed from this check-in so now we're trying to consolidate a bit and that will get more and more clear in 2024. But right now, we're trying to clean up our YouTube channel because we had somebody, I've been saying, it's not the algorithm, I just suck. And it is, in fact, the case that I suck. (laughs) And so we had some professionals look at our page and they said, you're not only confusing your audience, you're also confusing the algorithm because I put out too much content and it's not all... The same thing. Right. It's too varied. And YouTube, the algorithm doesn't know who to serve us to. And you listeners, you brilliant and nuanced and the buffet experience of humanity, we try to serve all of the different facets of the human experience. The algorithm does not like like no, that. The, the algorithm, algorithm likes you to stay in your lane. Yep, it <laughs> wants me to stay in my lane. And if the algorithm knew me at all, it would know I've never had a lane. <laughs> <laughs> there was never a lane that Bridget didn't want to immediately cut out of. <laughs> there was never a lane that that I didn't yeah. And, and find some sort of alternate route. <laughs> if you are in Austin also, I'm doing stand up again and it's we're started we, we started from the bottom and now we're here still at the bottom. <laughs> um so I'm building a new set from the ground up. My friend who has been on this podcast and I love her has a show, Ariel Norman. She's been on once. I I need to have her back on. Yeah. Uh, she, you'll, you probably know her as Ellen DeGenderless if you follow her on social, which is what I almost called her when I was just right now talking about her, which is not, shows me how too online I am when I forget the name <laughs> of my friend in real life and only know her by her, 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 her handle. handle. <laughs> Well, she gave me a residency. She has a great, very loving show at the East Austin Comedy Club every Tuesday night at 7, free wine. And she gave me the opportunity to go down there every Tuesday and just start. I mean, we are we are starting from scratch, folks. My life has changed so much between now and when I was last on stage that it's almost it, it it actually shocks me every time I get on stage and I'm working on the material, just how much has changed in a short period of time. And it's fun. 
It's a good audience. Maggie, cousin Maggie's been. Yep. It's a lot of fun. It's a great little, it's a great room. It's a tiny it's, room. It's fun to see Bridget back on stage. They get other good comics in there. Yeah. They had Tyra Vera who will come on this podcast. Yeah. It's been, it has been great just to be, it makes me feel actually sane to be doing that again. Mm-hmm. So I was joking that I, and I should tell this joke on stage that I could either become a wealthy pundit or a failed comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Guess which one she chose. <laughs> and I think I'd rather be a failed comedian than a successful pundit. At least I won't hate myself, but I'll probably still be poor. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot going on. A lot. So Substack. They we trans dumpster fire was a podcast RSS feed that was audio only. We transferred that over to Substack, and now I'm going in and replacing all the audio files with video files. So all of dumpster fire will be there with all of the mostly unedited versions. I'm uploading all like all of the video versions of Walkins Welcome. And all the all the factory settings are in there behind the paywall. Basically, everything we're doing is in there. We're going to be doing some of Bridget's vintage articles that she has published that can no longer be found on the internet anywhere. Yep. Um, and, and there just, will be the community and the book club. And, and exclusive writing and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. We just want it to be a place. Sanity and levity. Those are my... And I look, sanity, I'm not like... By any means sane. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I always joke, you're not crazy. The world is crazy. You're actually crazy too, though, because how can we not be in a crazy, how can we not be crazy in a crazy world? But I do want to create a community. You know, we're not a news show. We're not, we're just, we're just, it is the Jack Kerouac quote I always think about. I have nothing to offer the world but my confusion. We're just offering the world our confusion and our laughter and and maybe how we got out of our own way. Mm-hmm. And that's really it. I want to just serve up. And the politically homeless letters, which I think give a voice to a lot of people who feel voiceless. We'll be doing more with those in the election year. And we definitely want to hear from you if you feel, even if you don't feel politically homeless, if you feel more radicalized and and entrenched in a side than ever, we also want to hear from you. It's not just people who feel lost in the culture wars. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to hear from the people who don't feel lost. Maybe you can lead Maybe you can us. help the rest of us. <laughs> Show me <laughs> a little like, bit. Once again, I don't have a lane. I just don't feel represented. Mm-hmm. Where are my people? There are dozens of us. And so that's where we are, trying to trying to consolidate in one place and uh, and, and organize <laughs> and then rebuild. Yes. 2023 was a was a chaotic year of lots of moving parts literally. Yeah. So now we are now we put down our roots. Focused rebuilding focused on rebuilding as we head into what will inevitably be inevitably be a crazy year yeah it's already crazy yeah and pe- we haven't even begun to see the if trump gets oh god i mean i cannot I, wait and also <laughs> gets like found guilty on charges that could have him go to jail he's not going to jail He's going to be our next president. We all know it. Everyone knows it. It's 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 going to be interesting. So, you guys, honestly, we appreciate you listening, you telling your friends about us. I don't do this enough on this podcast. I appreciate all of you guys so much, especially the loyal listeners who are who have listened to this moment in this podcast. You you are the Walkins Welcome crew. And we just appreciate you because you make us, you make us feel like we're not crazy. And you make this possible. And you make this possible. And if you really want to support us, the best thing you can do, if you have the means, is to subscribe to our Substack, join the community. We're putting the walk-ins welcome there as well. So there is a place because 
I feel like so many people listen to walk-ins. Mm-hmm. It's it's free, right? Yep. The walk-in. Yep. So it's, it's open to everyone. Yeah. Everyone can comment. All you have to do is just get on our subscriber list and everyone can comment on those. It's open. I do feel like sometimes because subs, the the like the the podcast is on YouTube, the video, but the video then a lot of people just listen to audio. So that we're trying to get the entire fantasy community in and catalog and in catalog one in one place <laughs> where people can comment and yes. meet each other. And you can sign up for free for the free newsletter and get get notified when we post new stuff and you don't have to that that helps us, you know, just give us your email. <laughs> Uh, it, but yeah, if you want to subscribe, give us your email. It sounds like we're going to sell them. We're not. We're not. <laughs> the way Maggie just needs to like. Maggie's not online very much, <laughs> so she doesn't really know how to pitch things to people who no, are. No, I knew when skeptical. I said it. I was like, this is probably not the way I should be asking for this. <laughs> give us your email. <laughs> <laughs> give us your email. It sounds like a threat. <laughs> Give us your fucking email right now. <laughs> Give us your email. Hey, if we get a flood of emails, <laughs> that's just gonna be I'm our taking credit for it. A new call to action. <laughs> Maggie's give us your email. For some reason, I feel like people would listen to Maggie when she demands that they give us, give us your email. <laughs> We've just been going about it all wrong this whole time. <laughs> no, Maggie should be doing all the the ad sales. <laughs> Yep. So. How many more episodes before Christmas? One more? Of what? Walk-ins? Two more. There's, well, the one this is going on and then one more new one. And then we've got two archive episodes. Who's our last guest? Tom Sawyer, the com- the comedian. Oh, yes. Tom Sawyer. Hooray. Mm-hmm. We're ending on a comedy note. Yes. And I then- feel so good. I can't even tell you how good I feel being back on stage. Nothing nothing makes my it's all I want to do now yeah I know if she could give it all the rest of this up and no, just that's focus not on true. comedy that's not true I want to be like I want to I can do it all you truly are a jack of all trades the only reason we do so many things is because Bridget has so many ideas and is like we should do that and we've got a million more ideas we're sitting on that we just we want s- stuff we want to make that we just don't have time for or the resources for so Eventually. So subscribe to we'll fantasy.com. <laughs> so we can put together a team to deliver you even more content. I see the future of Substack is that I will be able to someday have produced the shows that I want to produce and people will be able to subscribe to them. Mm-hmm. In the future of of Fetacy, you will not just be subscribing for the janky <laughs> dumpster <laughs> fire man eye operation <laughs> you will be subscribing for a sick sci-fi comedy that's directed by mike judge <laughs> <laughs> mike judge has no affiliation with this show <laughs> <laughs> i'm just i'm just putting that out in the universe i'm just manifesting guys i've been spending some time on instagram and i know that i need to manifest mm-hmm so anyway, that's that's what we've been up to. A lot. <laughs> A whole lot of nothing. <laughs> Started from the bottom, now we're here. Still at the bottom. <laughs> Bridget said that earlier today. We were dying laughing. It's so funny. We're doing it, guys. Slowly. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-Ins Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)